This is Matt Brown, and you're listening to Just a Good Conversation. I love finding people who have a passion, and a photographer with passion is even better. And one with a great southern accent is gold. James Quantz is that very guy. I first saw his work when he was shooting for the Naval Academy. Then I found his YouTube channel, and I was hooked. I remember the week before that NBA game, that famous M- NBA game they canceled before it started, uh, I was starting to get emails in saying, we might have to postpone this virus thing and this, that, and the other. And then I just I remember when they canceled that NBA game, I physically almost got sick because I knew the things that had changed at that, at that moment, especially in my you know, line of business. I'm Matt Brown, host of Just a Good Conversation. Take a listen to our archives. My guests have ranged from boxing cut men, athletes, and director of photography for Getty Images, Max Wolfson. So I knew that each event I'd go to, I'd have to perform at the same level that they would have to perform. So I would, would come back. They trusted me with their pictures. They trusted me, you know, when that button is, when, when I hit send, that photo was going out to the world with their name on it, not my name. However, I knew I played a big part in it. But for me, I realized that those relationships that I'd be building with them would hopefully lead me to a place where, you know, one day I'd feel comfortable enough to actually manage them. And I don't think there's any way I could have gotten to where I am today without starting where I did and building those relationships back in my early 20s where they saw how hard I worked and they knew that I put in the same amount of effort as them. Go to justagoodconversation.com for all our archives. Let's take a quick break from my sponsor, or diving into my conversation with James Quantz. I have got the wonderful and talented man from South Carolina. I will probably have an accent by the time of this. James, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well today. But unfortunately, I can't tame my accent down. I can I can raise it up a little bit, but I'll uh, I'll try to keep it. Uh, no, no, no. Please keep it under. I want to hear you on the level here, so people can understand me. <laughs> I want to hear a y'all. I want to hear uh, something about sweet tea. And, and, yeah. and something at least about the Gamecocks, because it seems like you hey, must y'all, have... come, y'all come back now. You hear? <laughs> uh, were, you, uh, were you? Are you a born and raised South Carolinian? Yeah, I, 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 I was born here in, in Columbia, but I've I've moved around, but uh, I've I've found my way back. I'm kind of like uh, I guess Canadian goose, you know, but not Canada, I'm South Carolina. So I've migrated back here. Yeah, that happens. That happens. It's a beautiful. After some, it's a beautiful part of the country. Yeah, just don't come here in the middle of the summer when it's, you know, 100 degrees with 100% humidity and you get a like a 120 heat index and you can go out and cut the air with a knife. But that's all. <laughs> it's just. Yeah. No, it's brutal for people that aren't used to it. Yeah, that'll. Re- that brutal for us. That, that humidity just tears you up. If The heat's one thing, but then all of a sudden when it's literally like you're walking around in a shower. Oh, oh yeah, because when you, you can't really sweat, it just everything sticks to you and you just, you're just hot. Oh, so. God. No, it was pretty miserable then, but when tell me this, because I have uh literally, and we joked about this, have fallen in love with your channel, your work, your stuff with the Naval Academy is brilliant. What oh well thank you. When did you find uh a camera? When did when did you all of a sudden decide you like hearing the, the sound of the shutter? Uh well that was probably way, way back when I was little. My dad was um kind of an engineer he was more he was kind of on that engineering side and and was always somewhat of a camera geek himself i actually have his canon ae1 sitting on a shelf right here in my studio and uh so he uh he, on vacations and just around the house and stuff like that he was always the one taking pictures of everybody driving everybody crazy and <laughs> and he was using you know it wasn't like a one touch i mean it was a one when he was doing everything and so at a, at a young age i am um, i saw him doing it so then i kind of wanted to do it and then that's a fully manual camera so then he gave me like a book to to read to kind of learn the you know the the triad there of f stops and shutter speeds and uh film iso and stuff like that so um that's kind of where you know i mean i've got you know pictures um, you know, from way back, just being introduced that way uh, with him. And uh, and I can still remember just seeing other, like, um, you know, grand photographs and you know, like Ansel Adams and stuff like that. And we would go on 
trips and vacations and then i had my little camera and, and just none of my stuff would ever <laughs> pan out to uh you know what i was seeing others do and then that that always kind of you know led into like a hunger of, of you know wanting to learn to uh to figure out how to make that happen uh and that was on the landscape end of things like when i first started i thought i was going to be uh in that world just shooting landscapes and um and actually really launched my I guess professional career using like a four by five field camera and uh, shooting black and white film and uh, for your higher end golf clubs like Augusta National where they had the Masters on this past week and uh, then I would do uh, my own prints in the basement of my house and and um, deliver prints to clients like that. So wow. I, I kind of jumped ahead on that but, one, but that's, but that's how it starts, right? It's always like a yeah. introduction that way, especially with, you know, dads watching dads, you idolize them. That look. Yeah. You know. And and we used to give him such a hard time too. When he tried to get everybody together, you know, get your, get over here and take your picture and stuff like that. And obviously, you know, now being a dad myself, I'm, I'm totally doing that role and have tried to coach my daughter into not giving me too much of a hard time. And, 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 <laughs> And just kind of showing her like pictures of me when I was little. See, this is I and, and explaining, talking through stuff that you know my dad, his generation didn't really have. Uh, you know, I guess that experience. And so I was, you know, I can I can now talk her through what I felt when he always wanted, you know, me and everyone, you know, my sister and stuff like that to get in a picture. And, <laughs> right, settle down. <laughs> and, right, right. So, but that, but now I'm so glad we did that because we have those memories, we have those photos from. You know, and and stuff like that. I mean, you get you know our age, and without photos, you kind of tend to forget a lot of things. Or you you know, a photo will trigger a memory, which you know is usually a good thing. Right? So. Oh yeah. Like so. it's some of the greatest things I'll look at in my photos that my dad had taken. It's like, oh, my thirteenth birthday, and I forgot. You know, Jimmy Crow was there, and Mark Robson, and right, know, right. Oh, that that's right. They made me this train cake for my birthday there's just little things like that that if yeah but you would never remember no. with that without having you know that to archive that memory so then you look back and you go god i, I apologize dad i wish i would have paid attention a little more and would have looked at you yep. when you were taking those photos i know i wish he was still here now because i wasn't a father when when we lost him unfortunately so i didn't i didn't see the other side of that coin which uh but i, I lived it so now when when i start to kind of see it <laughs> from my daughter and stuff, I'm able to just kind of, I guess, you know, um, tell her that, you know, I went through that too. And, and, um, but I'm so glad that, you know, I did have pictures and, and whether that hits or not, she's, she puts up with it, right. but hell they've got, you know, phones and, and all that kind of stuff now. So I think everything's documented. These oh days. God. Yes. I mean, th- your, your daughter's probably had more photos taken of her before she was 10 than you ever had of your lifetime. <laughs> and video yeah oh and, that too so, god and, and 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 with using something just the size of my hand which is crazy i know i mean you know we were lucky if we had you know silent 16 millimeter maybe color film and now she's got 4k you know video and she can send it to anybody in the world <laughs> right right and or, or play it on you know a 65 inch flat screen and it looks great right and you're like ah. Uh, <laughs> Damn it. Not those old black and white 12 inch tubes we used to look yeah, at. Yeah. And you barely had any quality to it whatsoever. It's like, exactly. that may or may not Re- be me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes I'm hoping it wasn't me or you couldn't tell it was me. <laughs> did, did you follow the path of the interest in high school and like do the photo or the yearbook or take pictures in high school? Yes and no. I, I, like I said, I kind of, you know, I had a camera and so I knew how to work a camera and that all that kind of good stuff going into high school. Um, but so, but I was playing sports and all, and then I got hurt playing football and, you know, I'm on the sideline. I remember, you know, watching games. And so, you know, I was like, God, I should just, I should bring my camera um, out here. And, uh, and then where I went, I went to a boarding school and we had a, um, a dark room there. So, I did. I, I took my camera out to like the next game and took a bunch of pictures and then went to the dark room and kind of uh, introduced myself on how to develop my own black and white film and, and then make prints out of, uh, you know, the ones that, that turned out. And I was in there. I remember in there doing that. And someone that worked for the little school newspaper and the yearbook and stuff like that, there was kind of the same staff. They saw some of my photos and were like, hey, can we use these for 
you know, the next issue of so-and-so. And so I was like, sure. And then that grew into, Hey, we got a, you know, a, another football game next week. You can be out there taking pictures. And then from football, I went to, you know, other sports and stuff like that. So, uh, that did kind of, I did kind of, I guess, backdoor into shooting the sports and, um, those types of things for the, uh, the school newspaper and, and the yearbook. Thank God you weren't on the chess club. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that's, that's some riveting <laughs> photography there. Yeah, that would have been really fun. <laughs> um, that's when you have to set the scene more. You have to you have to set design for those shots. Uh huh. Absolutely. Were was those moments of watching your images come up in the tray magical for you in the dark? Yeah, room? I mean that's and that's something you know you kind of lose uh, in this day and age with you know the digital. I mean, you still get it to a certain extent, maybe even in Photoshop when you when you're kind of going to uh, when you flat um, like after you work on something and, and you go back to where you started and where you ended, you can still kind of get a semblance of that, but it's hard to, to top that feeling of, of, you know, running, you know, cause you see it in the enlarger first. Uh, well, first, you know, you see it in, in camera and some really good books on that are the three by Ansel Adams, the, the camera, the negative and the print, mm -hmm. I believe. Yep. Three amazing um, books. And, it's true. So you, and, and he talks about the pre-visual visualization. So you're there when you, you, know, you frame that shot and with the large camera, I'm going back to the, the field camera again. So you have to meter for the, um, use the zone system. So you meter, um, for the shadows and set those at a certain zone. And then you, you kind of scribble in a notebook, what your exposure was, how many stops, uh, from the, the shadows to the blacks from the whites and sky or whatever. Right. And then adjust your, uh, developing times according to that and so when you get to that point where you know you see the uh, print and the developer um yeah that's that's a pretty magical uh experience i know it's, from, it's so from weird. nothing yeah it's i can still close i haven't done it in i don't know 30 years 25 years i could still close my eyes smell that dark room yeah you know get that sense of that red light you know, everything's kind of dim. And then those trays that we had and watching it just appear on the paper. I don't know if I can even get that in Photoshop because it's just, it was so surreal to be in there and watch something create like that. Right. No, it is. It's completely magical. Just where it just, it just comes from, from nothing in a way, I guess in a, when you do maybe like a Polaroid or something like that, you know, obviously the quality right. not unless you've got, you know, every single factor line up perfectly for a really good Polaroid, but it's something kind of similar to that when you're waiting for it to develop sitting there. But it's when you've got all this work going in on the front end of one of those images and, um, you know, you've dodged and burned under the enlarger and stuff like that and, and watch that come through in the developer. It's, it's, um, it is pretty magical. But then, like you say, I mean, I can, I can still smell and taste like the fixer. <laughs> That's some rough, rough stuff, and you can get you know you hang in there for a couple of hours. You can get some pretty good headaches in there. Oh, good buzz, real good buzz. Oh my god, <laughs> no, that's, that's more on the bad buzz side, I would say. Oh, absolutely, because <laughs> you know when you're with that magic cap would keep you coming back for more. So <laughs> that Actifine gets you every time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that worried about fentanyl. They should have been in the dark room with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would OD a long time ago. Oh God, yeah. When did you start to feel maybe it was after high school, during high school, like this could be something you want to do for a career? Uh, it was when I was doing something else for a career when I wasn't uh, enjoying it very much. Um, and so then I started doing, um, you know, photography just kind of on the sides after work. And then this kind of goes back to the darkroom thing again. <laughs> so I would kind of go out and, and shoot stuff on the weekends and then, uh, do prints and, and stuff like that during the week. I'd and after work, I'd go home, eat dinner, and then go out to, I had a shed in the back, my backyard and I would go and, um, uh, process prints and stuff like that, uh, at night. And so, uh, from there, then I kind of just sold, I would sell some to interior design places and stuff like that. I mean, nothing big, but, uh, it was something where, I started researching, uh, you know, the possibilities of, of turning that into a career. Yeah. That's an, that's an interesting step that the job you're doing, you don't like, and all of a sudden you fall back onto that old love. Right. Yeah. I mean, I totally built, I just, there was a, just a, like a shed in the back of my, uh, in the backyard at my, one of my you know house I was living in. 
<laughs> and uh and just you know having that that drive i just finished finished it out roughly obviously just light proofed it and sure. uh, put a you know as we were talking about heat here earlier putting uh put a window unit in the one of the walls and Oh God! Sit yeah. out there, <laughs> yes, and work on that. You otherwise you wouldn't make it through the summer. Like, no, no. God, I mean that would be some kind of a torture. That'd be a prison room. hot box. Yeah, that's what they yeah. probably have in, you know. Some and then st- and too. So I mean, if, and if you worked in the dark room, you got to keep those chemicals around room temperature too. So right. Uh, that was another part of it. Yeah. No. 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 They can't be at one hundred and two. No. <laughs> no. That you'd be fast <laughs> prints. <laughs> that would be a super fast uh, in and out. Oh, man, so I mean, uh, was there ever any time you were you know because we're so fortunate we're in a career of photography it's so split apart where you've got advertising, landscaping, real estate. Were you kind of thinking which kind of part of that pie you wanted to work in? Well, I mean, I was thinking. I didn't know what I was thinking. I, all I knew is I enjoyed doing uh, you know photography. And it was just a, that kind of gray area then. It was a lot different than it is these days because there was no, you know, wasn't much internet. Um, we were talking like in the uh, late 90s. And, uh, and then obviously shooting films. So every time you took an exposure, it cost money. Yeah. Uh, and you couldn't just learn on the fly like that. So anyway, that and, and just the hurdle to try to figure out how to make steady money uh, was a pretty sizable hurdle back then. So I ended up, um, cashing in my chips and, and going, moving to Atlanta and went to, uh, kind of a photography program, uh, in Atlanta for like a year and a half to try to bridge that gap somewhat. And, and that introduced me to kind of more of the studio flow of things and using strobes and, uh, that type of thing. Yeah. Cause that's a big jump from what you learned at high school and from your dad and books to like, have you know actually having a solid foundation of how strobe lights and exposures and composition all those things if you don't right. really have that it's hard to learn pre youtube right i mean that's just it's impossible no you mean you had to had to just do it or, or learn from people that were doing it at the time so that was you know that meant like with school we would have assignments and i was in it was an advertising school that i went to and so they had folks that were studying to be creative directors and uh, designers and stuff like that. So they would group everybody together and give them an assignment. And so, uh, you know, they would be doing the creative direction and kind of give you kind of what they were looking for. And you had to execute on the photo end. Um, so it was kind of a mini, you know, mini world, I guess, advertising world. Uh, and, and you just kind of work your way through that process. And then from there graduated to, uh, assisting, uh, you know, working photographers. What about, advertising attracted you because right because there's so many fields what was that that you felt there was a calling okay so i'll i'll go back to uh the that second kind of part of getting into it where it's you know the school learning you know in school with assignments and stuff and then kind of graduating i actually left early um didn't graduate from that school and just kind of went straight in i had I, on the side i was working for a couple of professional photographers and they're within their studios in Atlanta and had the opportunity to kind of go, go in and and get a lot of, they wouldn't say it was like full time, but enough time to where I was making money instead of spending money going to, you know, school. And so, uh, just being in that environment, uh, it was just the kind of synergy between, I guess you're watching, uh, how they would land work. And then, uh, you know, you'd have clients in and you kind of entertain clients when I mean, you had, you know, these nice studios with, uh, kitchen setups and you'd have, uh, <clears throat> you know, lunch and, you know, it's, it's like a full day where you kind of spend with these people and you're creating stuff the whole time based off of, uh, you know, a vision that the end client is using the advertising firm who was then using the photographer and, you know, designers and stuff like that to, put together, you know, it's all these ingredients into a pie and just the whole process was, uh, just something that really kind of, I don't know. It's, I mean, even to this day, it's just something I find exciting. Right. No, it, it very is. It's, it's sexy. It's a very interesting part of the photography pie is advertising. Right. Yeah. I mean, and you're, you're, you're trying to create something that's obviously going to kickstart, uh, something in someone that sees it to, you know, do something or buy something or, uh, you know, what have you go somewhere, that type of thing. And so, you know, you've got to really deliver 
on what they're wanting to, to do and, and on their vision. Uh, even if, you know, sometimes if it's not what your vision would be, I mean, you're, you're basically a tool um, for these agencies, for these clients uh, to put forth their vision. And that's another kind of cool part, too, is, is when you've maybe worked with a client several times that they kind of start to trust your input and that type of thing. And then the game on that end is trying to figure out, I guess, the playing field to where, you know, you'll know that your input might be well received or you kind of, you know, it's better to kind of keep it to yourself type of thing. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's like a game of poker, I guess, in, in a certain sense when you're working from the standpoint of someone like myself, who's, um, your main purpose is to be a tool, but at the same time, I, um, I bring experience and stuff like that to the table. So, um, when to share and not share that type of thing is, is kind of part of it. Yeah, that is so true. That is so true. Cause there's so often they just want you to do their storyboard or their creative mood board and, and knock Correct. it out. And then, everything- and, and a lot of times they don't want you to, you know, input anything. And that's where you got to figure that out. Right. Cause if you're the guy who's forcing your vision, which can be sometimes confused or sometimes not confused with ego and stuff like that, then you're just not going to get hired again by that client. So the goal is, is obviously the opposite of that. And I think when you do give your input at the right times, that helps facilitate that next you know job when it comes around. So did that take you a little while to figure out when to put that input in and when to back off and not say anything? Well, it's, I mean, it's different based off who you're working with and it's, uh, you know, I might have a job next week where I know there's a comfort level there and uh, maybe I've worked with them before and then I kind of know it's more of a collaborative effort. And then the next week I know that I'm going in to push the shutter button, basically set my lights and, and do exactly what they're asking me to do. Um, and you know, how to pose models and our athletes or, you know, what have you. And it's just more of, you know, basically kind of just cranking out widgets. So, yeah, um, it's just a job to job and, and um, type of thing. But, but then, you know, that keeps it interesting. Right. No, absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a dance. It takes a couple of years to figure out when you pick your partner when you just leave her there because it's, you know, because, <laughs> right. because you could be like sitting there going, no, listen, I can make you better pitchers. And they don't care because they've had – hours and hours of creative ideas going into this. And this is what their client wants. And you've got to make it period. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, they don't want to say it, but it's shut up monkey and push the button. Exactly. And then that's, you know, and and you get a several jobs like that in a row and and it can kind of grind on you somewhat. And then that's kind of where it's nice to maybe go out and, uh, create your own type of thing. Um, do your own kind of personal project type of thing. Yeah. That release. Yeah, absolutely. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I've always tried to tell people like have a release project. Cause you're always going to be in a bit of a grind no matter what you do. And if you don't have something, you could just say, okay, this is for myself for a couple hours. You're just going to squeeze all of your creative juices out of yourself. Not doing that. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and then you kind of, then it starts to be work, which is none of us want to work. Yeah, no, no. I mean, we're, we've been faking it for years. We don't want to work. Right, exactly. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> when, when did you start to feel uh, you were ready to go on your own and start, you know, working for you instead of working at somebody else's place? Uh, so, I mean, that's kind of, I mean, you just kind of have to feel your, your way around, build, you know, all the while you know, working, um, in someone else's place, you know, I'm, I'm doing stuff on the side, uh, on the weekends, you know, when I get a chance and just kind of crafting a portfolio, although it was, at that point, I, I really didn't have a sense of direction of what type of photography I wanted to, to fully do. So I was doing a lot of landscapes mixed with like some product stuff. I mean, it's stuff you would see in an amateur's portfolio, basically, you, uh, uh, you know, a jack of all type of trades and master of none. Right. And, and so, you know, I just was, was shooting to shoot and, you know, you're not, you're not going to land the, the dream gigs, uh, with, with that type of, uh, work, you know, in front of yourself, you, you got to, uh, you know, I guess kind of figure out yourself uh, um, a little bit more. Right. Yeah. And so, but, but I was, I mean, I was doing little kids portraits in people's living rooms and then I kind of, uh, was able to carve out that niche, um, with some of these nicer 
uh, golf clubs, uh, golf, you know, um, courses where I would go and, uh, do the landscape work, uh, on their courses and then sell them, uh, the prints and stuff like that. So that was kind of my introduction to doing, you know, bringing in my own income and, uh, always being a, a fan of sports and stuff like that. I, I kind of, in the back of my mind knew that would be a direction I would want to go in, but I just wasn't confident enough at that time to, you know, say, put an athlete in front of my camera and tell them what to do. Right. Basically. Yeah. That's a big jump, especially if you've been a sports guy and then, yeah. I, and then you're trying to say, okay, I'm going to tell Michael Westbrook, like to do this and this in a portrait. Well, Bru- that, good right. luck. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, that, there's a huge leap and, and going back to, assisting so the studio i worked with they had like a still life shooter a product shooter and kind of a people shooter so it's two photographers and they had a split studio and so one day i would end up on the you know still set and another day i would end up on the people you know people set Mm -hmm. and i got to where and and going into this i thought that you know i would i guess I'm, i'm somewhat of an introvert and so I thought that, you know, I was going to be the landscape guy out by myself or shooting products, you know, in my studio by myself, maybe one other person just where, you know, I was, I was moving something and not having to direct any, you know, anybody just did no interaction with, you know, the person in front of my camera right. or the object in front of my camera. But then having that experience of being on those two different sets, I'd get by, I just started to dread the days that I was on the still set mm-hmm. and, really enjoy the days you know, around more people and, and the interactions between that photographer and the models and stuff like that. And it, it just, it, to me, it was, it looked like a lot more fun than, um, you know, doing your still life stuff where you move something, uh, on, you know, a quarter of an inch and take another frame and <laughs> yeah. uh, move the lights, you know, uh, you know, you can get a million different things to, to fool with there. But no. it's pretty monotonous. A- Angie Harmon is way better to look at than a, uh, yeah. a purse. <laughs> even even if I have a creative director in my my ear, um, telling me what to do, and they've my, they've got my screen on Zoom up in New York, watching all the frames come across, and, and coaching me how to direct her where she can't hear them, but I can hear them, and <laughs> then I have to. I mean, I feel like a newscaster. I had. <laughs> I had earbuds in and they were talking to me and then I was having to relay to her because they didn't want her to hear their feedback. Of course uh, not. Um, that was, that was, <laughs> and that was last year about this time. So, I mean, and talk about nervous. I'd, I'd never, just with the COVID situation, um, you know, the access on set was so limited. And so, you know, they kept their, in travel and they kept their staff up in New York, but they wanted to see everything. So I had to, uh, you know, have a, screen sharing software like zoom mm-hmm. and then have uh an audible connection where they could talk to me and uh so that was a little nerve-wracking yeah that young lady is a beautiful beautiful person i photographed her a million years ago when she started on law and order or order of law or LA yeah, law, law and order whatever the hell the laws were back then and, and, and this one of them like, still going on i yeah, think i know it's probably the longest running show ever and yeah, she was just beautiful in front of the camera. No, yeah, she knew what she was. And, and someone like that is once you start working with them, they and you've worked with people like that before, and, and you kind of let them do their thing and keep direction to a minimum. Uh, that makes life, you know, it just it, it, it really you can kind of just get a flow going. And as long as you don't prolong that flow and you kind of give them direction when you feel like you know, you kind of instinctually know, uh, that's those shoots can go just really smoothly. Oh yeah. I mean, if everybody was a professional, like, you know, it's funny, you'll shoot like say CEO that he doesn't know his good side, his bad side. He's going to tell you immediately, can you take 20 pounds off? And then you shoot something like Angie and she knows exactly where to put her chin and bring her eye to you and position her shoulders. And you're just like, Oh, this is easy. This is right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you got to keep the energy going and stuff like that. Cause even on those types of sets, as you know, that, um, you know, you just, you kind of got to keep it, keep it paced. Cause you normally don't have much time at all to work with them. And no. that was kind of the case there too. So. Yeah. 
But and but the good thing is, it's really your fault if nothing's made. She's she's putting herself oh, perfect yeah. for you, and you just got to go. Bing, 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 done. Well, Next. that's that's the good and the bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can't, but there's no other place to put the blame. Well, your advantage was you had digital. When I shot it, I was on a Hasselblad, so I had yep. I had like five backs set up ready to go. And it's like, don't screw these up. Make sure right, you got to shoot the shoot the Polaroid um, to <laughs> do your test. Yeah, and uh, then go from there. Yeah, no, I've been there. Yeah, 90, not, nine, not for ninety seconds trying to make a joke while I'm waving it, trying to make sure the exposure is right. Yeah, and and everyone's looking over it and looking, you know. You- and it's funny too the transition you know from that to uh you know the digital was um and i was kind of there that's when i was assisting and you know it was it was tough for some of those older school photographers that, yeah uh you know they weren't used to having people right over their shoulders looking in their cameras and then you know graduate to tether to a computer and uh seeing everything that came across there was you know it was kind of kind of hidden and and you're kind of exposed uh when stuff comes across and you know it doesn't look right so where in that career for you are you making that transition in from film to digital did you jump on it early late 90s early 2000s or were you kind of a little hesitant into digital where did you embrace it well i was so manual on one end because i was working with a four by five uh you know negative you know camera doing the landscape stuff, you know, at the time. And, uh, then that's when the digital started coming in and I guess around 2000 and, uh, I, I jumped right, right on it. Basically. I got the, I've got a Nikon D one X sitting here looking at me oh, next to yeah. my, next to my dad's Canon a one. <laughs> and, uh, so what I did is, is, as bought that and then convinced, uh, you know, what the photographers I was assisting, that, hey, you know, I've got this camera. If you want to try digital, you can, you know, I'll rent this camera to you. And then I ended up, you know, doing that and then got a laptop, which, you know, back in the day might have had, you know, a hundred megabyte hard drive yeah, or something. 128 or something. And it would hang up every like five frames. <laughs> and I have to restart the computer. Uh, it was a nightmare. But that was kind of the first transition into uh, shooting tethered and digitally. And so, but, you know, talking about the photographer just kind of not being used to that, having a client. So I was, you know, in this case, working for this photographer, they would keep me kind of off to the side, like underneath a, you know, we would get um, kind of just some material and hang it around. It's almost like a tent that I was under. Right. And basically would just give him thumbs up on exposure and thumbs up on sharpness. <laughs> and then he would come in and look at him and the client could not see him or, the, you know, your talent on set. No one could see it except for you know, me and the photographer. So unless he approves something for them uh, to look at. Yeah. So that's like, that's early Digitech work right there. Yeah. So that's kind of, yeah. I transitioned kind of into doing the, you know, the first kind of digital tech type stuff. So. Yeah. Because those guys really were magical because it was such an unusual scenario to figure out getting stuff from the camera to the computer and understanding the archive and then getting those files to a client you know, yeah. FTPs were unusual, you know, hard drives weren't cheap. It was such a weird time in that transitional period. It was a full period. on transition. I just remember first, with, you know, using that, 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 that Nikon D1X, which was a 5.3 or 4 megapixel camera. And that was massive. Oh, and it was, yeah, yeah, you could beat somebody up with that, that thing. It's just solid as a rock over here yeah uh but it was you know just to take a frame and see it instantly on the back of the camera uh you know that was that was new then wow and i felt like i was cheating you know because normally you had to do you know the polaroid and then (laughs) Uh like you were just talking about and then you send the the lab you know sometimes you do a part of the shoot send the um film to the lab have them push it you know push process bring it back in an hour and um continue (laughs) your shoot from there so this kind of eliminated all that. And, and it's interesting that you jumped all in because those cameras were not cheap. Well, and that's then. where I kind of, I was like, you know, they, they were asked if they could use it. I was like, well, you can rent it. <laughs> Cause right. it was, it was over $5,000. And that was a lot of money yeah, compared, my, my, to, <laughs> compared to the other photographic equipment you could have purchased. That was a ton. Yep, I, 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 I jumped in and that was the, you know, the leading 
uh, camera at the time. So, and then Fuji, I think came out with a couple and then Kodak had one and believe it or not. And, yeah. Everybody uh, was kind of in on it. Kodak, Canon, everybody yeah, was Canon, to... But Nikon was kind of the first one with that D1X. Yep. The, the, and, and I already, and I was using Nikon, uh, glass. And so I, um, you know, kind of, that, that kind of pushed me into it, but, um, yeah, I... it's, how did you explain the crop factor to our, every photographer that wanted to know what the hell you mean? There's a crop factor. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just, um, you, you've got to, I can't even remember how we crossed that bridge to be honest, but I, I think it was yeah, because I think everyone was just amazed at the technology at the time. It wasn't like, you were worried about it and you just adjusted with the, the lens. Yeah. I thought it was my most difficult point with digital was when, do you remember when they had that mat around it? So you can still see outside the crop factor. And yeah. Vaguely. Yeah. You can. And, and so it was like, that's not in, but the sharp stuff is, and it was like, Oh my God, that now was, are, was this like a um, like a medium format back or was this no? Like it was on a it was on the it was on a it was on a Nikon like their version of the N ninety but then it had the Kodak digital bottom so it had this huge thing it ran down the length of your forearm it was like, okay yeah I don't think I ever used one of those N nine thousand oh thank God you've saved yourself the insanity <laughs> of trying to look through and try to frame that up it was really brutal I was trying too busy trying to recoup my investment on this the one app. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I remember trying to read the manual to that thing while going to the World Series and trying to figure out, oh, this this thing doesn't have much of a buffer. There's no. not there's not many frames in this thing. And then I no. trying to get enough cards to well, shoot. Well, and the batteries too. I mean, that you turn the thing on and the battery was dead in 5 minutes. It felt like. <laughs> that was it. And too. they were huge too. They were, you could it was if you, you could fit one in your pocket. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. It was such an unbelievable, ridiculous time that we got through to make pictures that it was so funny that we ever didn't just throw up our arms and be like, all right, we're done. We'll quit. I know. Well, I mean, it just teased you, though, all along the way because that technology was so cool and innovative and, and new and different and so immediate that, I, you know, I would carry four batteries with me <laughs> out on the field. Hell, I remember the battery charger was probably bigger than the camera. Oh, yeah. It was, uh, it was, it was really schlepping stuff around back then. It yeah. Was, but, but, you know, and then you're getting a, a picture that probably looked good at maybe, you know, right around probably 11 by 14 would be as big as you probably want to pull one of those. out. Of and that better be a two. There. Yeah. And that better be 200 ISO because if you shot anything, above yeah. eight, good luck. No, no, it was, it was a mess, but, um, you know, when you were controlling the light and stuff like that, that was, it was, it was, it was neat. It was kind of neat to kind of be part of all that and. No, it was a wonderful time. It was uh, to be in that transitional period was was like, it felt like that period where guys were doing four by five, and then they introduced medium format to them. Right. That's right. Like, yeah. Wow. I don't have to stare through a ground glass and yeah. Upside down. Upside down. Yes. <laughs> My son and Sky are always on the bottom. It's like what. Yeah. <laughs> right God. you get used to it after a while it kind of you have to tr trick your brain back see uh, there's another weird thing they did to us chemistry and then we had to look at things upside down yeah it's amazing yeah. any of us were able to like get through the day i know but i'm hoping <laughs> that all that experience kind of helps me make pictures these days and, and <laughs> you know you, that is that is a concrete if there's a concrete foundation that's for sure uh when 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 were you feeling len so then you're like okay I'm James. I'm going. I'm good. I'm on my own. <laughs> Yesterday? <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe 10 minutes ago. I, I don't know. <laughs> or maybe hopefully an hour from now I'll feel that way. Yeah. I know. It's, um, I, it depends on how I wake up in the morning and what my calendar looks like. Yeah, exactly. Is it empty or is it full? Um, that's exactly that's exactly it. And, and times like uh, you know the uh, pandemic shut down, that's – you know, that, that's when you question everything. I mean, how did you um, grind through that? Well, that's where, that's where I, I, I couldn't, you know, I can, I can still remember watching cause I'd, I had probably a good four months, four or five months of jobs lined up and they were all over, um, the country and, you know, the calendar never looked, you know, much better with some really great clients. And I remember the week before, that NBA game, the famous M NBA game, they canceled before it started. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I was starting to get emails in saying we might have to postpone because of this um, this virus thing and this, that, and the other. And then I just I remember when they canceled that NBA game, I physically almost got sick because I knew the things that had changed at that at that moment, especially in my you know line of business. And sure enough, um, I think it was like because it was on a weekend when that happened, and, and I think even on like Sunday, I just I got all these you know, emails from basically everyone that I was lined up with saying, we've got to postpone and, you know, and basically postpone is cancel. And right. so, you know, you, you wake up with nothing to do and, um, you know, a lot of people had that problem. So, um, but I guess being somewhat, you know, kind of having a creative mind, I, I was having trouble sleeping and then, um, I just knew I needed to give my something myself something to do and then that's kind of when I, when I started making the uh, videos and stuff on YouTube. Yeah, I mean that's it's an it's an interesting pivot because you've got all these things lined up, you know, and it's the two weeks flatten the curve, you know, things will happen, everything's going to be great to okay, let's put myself on this channel, create it and then hopefully there's somebody there to watch it. <laughs> right. Because everybody was Everybody, well, I, you know what? To be honest, I didn't really care if we were watching. Just I, I needed a project. I needed something to start, uh, you know, and work through and finish. And you know, in that case, it was, you know, it had to do with photography. I knew I kind of needed to do some more work on the video end of things, and so that marked off two boxes there. And uh, you know, and there's just the hell with it. I got, I got to do something. So um, <laughs> that's that's where I went with it, and. Um, yeah, and, and then you know I've, I've kind of continued it on. Well, the the first the first one you have on your site is the Gamecocks athletic behind the scenes photo, but that one says eight years ago. Yeah, so that was that was one more for like promotional purposes to uh, kind of show what goes into one of my photo shoots and then the end result type of thing. And and I think that actually <laughs> sparked a lot of athletic. Uh, programs to change things on how they would market their sport their in-house sports Mm -hmm. um like your your higher end um or your your kind of top tier um, football programs to start with uh i think a lot of you know schools and and stuff like that ended up (laughs) referencing that video and then you know trying to replicate it on their end and it's that whole industry is totally been blown up out of out of nowhere in the last you know eight ten years completely changed completely changed it was literally just they would take old action photos from previous years and let some guy graphically put up together poster now it's literally an advertising campaign exactly and it's um and it's gone now from maybe taking i think the first the first one, the first ones was that, that shoot that's on there. Actually, I did one the year before that I'm looking for, I don't have the poster here, but it was, I think four players and the coach who was Steve Spurrier at the time. Mm -hmm. And so they, they um, brought in there. Actually we did, I think we did enough players for each ticket. So I think it was seven or eight players. And, uh, And then they put four on the poster with coach and then used the other ones on tickets. And that was, you know, all we did. And then, uh, and then you fast forward to nowadays, and it's everybody on the team of gets course. in front of my camera. Of course, everybody. Yeah, yeah. It, They're gonna and they run and they run that stuff in places you hadn't even thought of. Oh uh, well, it's. I mean, it's really it's it's amazing. I mean, it's a whole. They had nobody like I can use the university here. They had no one over there doing that. I mean, I was basically doing it, and um, and I was doing the composite and Photoshop work. Um, for probably the first five years and then it got to where then I could just send them the photos and, and then consult with the, they had, they had hired a designer and now they've got probably a staff of probably 10, 12 full time. And then, you know, an army of interns over there that, that that's all they do now. Jesus. Yeah. You could, you could fly from day to day to day and shoot so many football programs doing that exact same thing now. Right, but and the, and not at, just football, basketball, women's oh, yeah. basketball, hockey, 
cross country, like everybody's doing it now. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, the issue is they don't want to pay anything to, you know, for someone to do it. And that's, um, you know, where you run into like these schools, especially they're, they're really bad at that because they've got programs at the universities where they just pull these interns in and wear them out for a couple of years and then just rotate them out when those guys get burned out. And you see it all on Twitter too, where people are, you know, at, at the end of seasons or, you know, like around this time of year, you'll see a bunch of people say, I'm no longer with so-and-so right? You know, I'm going freelance or I'm moving to another, another school or another team. You know, it's almost like graduating from, you know, the college and you go to a pro team or something like that. Yeah. But it's, it's no different in the pro teams than the college teams. It's all, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll pay you as little as they can and work you as hard as they can. <laughs> Talk to me about how the Navy campaign f- started for you. How did that happen? Uh, so we shot the, uh, the, campaign obviously for this year and then the first one was last year's um army navy game and that was a kind of a covid thing too where um you know i I had the only thing i was really doing i was doing a couple little shoots here and there things that kind of started to open up a little bit and we're talking about the fall of was that 2020 or 20 21 i don't know yeah, yeah fall of 2020 and things that, you know, people been locked up all summer. And so <laughs> some things were kind of coming around. I did I actually did shoot with um, the Gamecocks here. Um, but anyway, flash, fast forward, um, they contacted me. Um, actually, um, for their athletic department, contacted me just because she had actually worked with the Florida uh, Panthers, the NHL team, and I'd done work with them. And so um, she'd seen my work and worked with my work um, with them. And they had to figure out something for Army Navy. Uh, And so she reached out and just asked if I would consult uh, just because, you know, there was there was unsure. Like I knew or they knew they didn't have any budget for it, for one thing. Uh, And then getting, you know, once again, uh, having people around uh, you know, during that time with, that was before that was pre-vaccine and everything. So, um, that was when testing and all that, I mean, everyone's still scared, you know, about what was going on. So there's just a lot of, you know, unknowns at that point. So anyway, she asked me to, uh, though, isn't that frightening though, that the Navy, no, no, that the Navy said they didn't have a, a, a budget for it. It's like, then why do you want this grandiose idea if you don't have a budget for it? That's always been well, a... But see, that's what, what actually kind of drew me to it because this uh, creative director, she was so passionate about the job that she was going to throw everything at it that she could, uh, even with you know limited resources based off of what was going on. I mean, her budget, it wasn't her fault. I mean, her budget was cut because of COVID. They couldn't sell tickets and they couldn't have fans. Yeah. Um, and this is the, you know, the athletic department of the Naval Academy. Um, and they're kind of somewhat separate and they're definitely, you know, separated from, uh, you know, the U S Navy. Oh, so yeah, it was right. not like they're getting government bucks. Yeah. To, it's uh, not the Pentagon money. <laughs> no. So, I mean, it's, they're separate from, from all that. So anyway, so going back to that, she was, you know, despite all of this going, you know, in the wrong direction, she was, really dreaming up um you know a really cool concept just was unsure of how she could make it happen and and you know part of that dreaming up was contacting me to see if i could you know uh instruct her guide her on possibly making it happen and within 10 minutes of being on the phone with her probably less than that yeah i just realized that it wasn't going to happen uh unless i went up and helped so (laughs) that's basically what i did they i mean they paid me to they paid my expenses basically put me up and uh because she didn't have the equipment uh and so but i had you know at the time i didn't have anything really else going on no who did who they, did nobody did and, and i've always you know that was kind of a bucket list type thing to work for you know to create something for one of the service academies and uh and so i mean that was right there on the front of my mind and uh and then knowing that she was up for anything. I mean, she was one to, you know, set off smoke and everything like this and go out in the river and um, <laughs> at night. And, you know, it was just crazy. But 
I mean, I can get into that. If, if someone wants to, to do all this stuff and they're willing to put it together, count me in. So no, I it, drove up. Yeah, and, it's, and it, it's a it. great thing. Any photographer just wants you to be able to allow them to create. Yeah. So it was everything was on the table, you know, outside of the stuff that was affected by the, uh, you know, virus and everything. So that was, um, yeah, I jumped at it, to be honest. And I just, you know, it was, it was too good not to. Yeah. It, it's some beautiful imagery for what you don't normally see from one of the services. You, you normally get a lot of what we shoot, right? A lot of screaming guys pretending to be Superman, pulling open their chest and stuff. But with, the, <laughs> right. I mean, if you do it for 10 years, you do it every nine years, uh, nine times out of the year. It's just so obvious. Right. But right. with the, with the river, type yeah, work. but with the river and the splashing and the water and then the, the post-production you put in with the clouds, the, the flags, fantastic. The lighting's great. And you know, even the, even the, you reference it in the video, the, the water spots that actually accidentally got there, but they work. Right. Yeah. That was um, because it was raining. Yeah. <laughs> Not only were we in the river, but it was pouring down rain. Uh, and know. I just gave up trying to keep my lens clean. And, uh, and so, I mean, it looks like something I might've done in post, but uh, that was all there, um, you know, in camera and just part of the magic of, of getting out there and just freaking doing it and getting, you know, and I don't know if people realize me, but I was out, because I really don't have a, a good shot of me getting some of those, but I mean, I was out in the river almost up to my waist taking some of those shots and it set all, when I put those up on like my Instagram and had some photographers try to replicate that with some teams they were working with. And <laughs> all the, all the ones that I saw, the photographer was on dry land and they were taking a picture of the guy like running out of the water. No. Nope. So you don't get that running side to side type of thing unless you're out in the, in the water. And so that was kind of, kind of funny just you know you gotta you gotta go to that next level if you want to get you know a shot that kind of looks like what i was doing with with navy I mean, you gotta get out there in it yeah and it was it's one of the things that photographers don't understand the subliminal messages where it feels like you're shoulder to shoulder with them like you're storming the beach with them right you know uh very you don't want it to look like cat you know where you're sitting in a lounge chair on the beach watching them storm it you, you got to be in there with them right or it's like you know you're doing a video i mean it's good to have maybe have that angle but you gotta have the other angles too to, to the full, you know flesh out the full scene mm -hmm. yeah well you what was their response when they finally saw the finished product that was my first time using the actual the canon r5 with the mirrorless the mirrorless camera so that was you know that's actually you know we've been talking about progressing through technology uh and then you know moving away from you know the the reef the mirror camera and uh and that was just phenomenal um to use uh that camera um for that project just because we were in super low light uh situations and um it would it just it worked really amazingly tracking um my subject where in the past i would have had to probably manually focus yeah and and then shot it that way and kind of you know probably had to would probably have had to you know adjust my iso so i could have a you know a wide enough f-stop to where you know i would have some latitude with focus there so um that just technology <laughs> gave me a lift there with that and and that was that was a super eye-opener using that uh the camera in that situation so um you know it was it was just really cool and they and they really loved the the results and that turned into uh, two more shoots with them. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's the best part. And that was, you know, something too, that we, we all hate it when, when someone calls and they got no budget and they're like, you know, if this works out, we've got some other work coming down the line and, and we'll, we'll be able to pay you full rate, that type of thing. And that is always kind of a turnoff. But I mean, this was a special situation with, you know, a special kind of client. And then with the, pandemic situation where their hands were tied and it wasn't their their doing and yeah that was uh, a like rarity a, the pandemic yeah, so. the pandemic threw everything upside down and then another thing that i always look at too is if i'm taking someone else's work away from them and by undercutting them or you know going in saying i'll do something and you know someone else was is there and capable um 
And so that's kind of one of my lines that I will, I won't cross. And, but they, they, you know, there was no one else there to do it. If I wasn't going to do it, they wouldn't have had it. Yeah. Uh, the, how was that time? I think it's the second or the, it's the last one you just did, but on the aircraft carrier, how was that <laughs> experience? That was, <laughs> I mean, that, that was just uh, amazing. I don't know. Uh, it's hard to, you know, you just, it's just crazy. The places that uh, a camera of all things, I mean, I call it kind of a key. And I think I mentioned it in the um, videos too, that uh, it's just, uh, it, it opens so many doors uh, and just having that camera and having the skill set that, that comes along, you know, where you can, you know, maneuver is like, I guess a musician that can, can play uh, at a certain level and they get to play in, in all these grand, uh, you know, s- situations. And so that was <laughs> just a, a remarkable uh, instance to where, you know, a camera has, has me out on an aircraft carrier in the middle of the Atlantic ocean <laughs> for, for two nights and three full days uh, working around a, a squadron of F-18s that are, you know, doing their thing. And, you know, I'm out on the tarmac with these planes when they're landing and taking off. And, uh, it was, it was just amazing. When you're, when you're landing on the aircraft carrier through the, you know, the, the airplane helicopter, were, were you like giddy, like a schoolboy? Like, I cannot believe I'm doing this. I mean, it must well, have... well, we were supposed to fly out like on a plane and land, but we ended up embarking with them and walking on the ship while they were in port. And oh, then we sailed okay. out. Um, but no, we, we weren't ever going to be in a helicopter. We were actually going to fly out and land, Oh God. but we ended up, we ended up flying off, which they call, they hook you to the catapult, just like they do the F-18s. Uh-huh. Um, and they put you in a, I believe it's an A2, uh, what they call a Greyhound. And, uh, you're facing the back of the plane <laughs> <laughs> and they strap you in all their safety gear. You got a four point harness. Uh, you're going to, I think you pull like four, four or five G's or something just because you go from zero to 150, 60, 70 miles an hour in three seconds. Uh, so it is you no know, like, and you've got the goggles with the helmet and this is the force of that, that catapult, the goggles actually come off of your head. And then when you are, when you get snapped and when you kind of get off of the carrier and you're released from that catapult, you know, your head comes back and the goggles snap back onto your, your face. <laughs> so it's, and we actually, uh, one of the guys that was doing video, he held his GoPro during that, and you can see exactly that, you know. Oh, my and, God. Uh, but that was that was intense. They call it a cat shot. And the, so we met the captain of the ship. We were on the H.W. Bush, and uh, he was he was laughing about, you know, how we were some of the few fortunate people in the world to ever get a cat shot off of a, um aircraft carrier. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah, so that was, that was pretty insane. And that was, and then, and then we go to uh, the Oceana Naval Air Station there in Virginia Beach and work for another two days uh, there with full access with the XO and the CO. And uh, and it was like we had our own air show going um, where they were out on the tarmac with walkie-talkies to the tower. And they had, I think, four F-18 circling. And they were doing different passes based off of what they were telling them and what we needed. That was mainly for video, but I got some really cool shots there doing that. So. One of those pinch me type of moments where you're like, yeah, I can't believe this is going on right now. How did the how did the servicemen take to you, right? Because now you're on their craft. It was well, and so and you know we we were kind of you know right in there with them. We we ate in the um, you know with the guys and uh, and obviously we were living on board and um, I mean it was it was a neat experience. They all, they were doing announcements while we were there. They did announcements before we got there that we were going to be there. And, uh, you know, and they, it was just like, you know, y'all, you know, be, you know, look, keep your eye out for these guys, help them out if you, if they need it, that type of thing. And they were, they were energized about it. I mean, they, they all kind of wanted to, to get a little, their 15 minute, you know, um, bits of fame there. Uh huh. Everybody um, wants to get in front of that camera. Yeah. So, um, no, it was, it was great. They were all kind of behind him. We you know, at the end of the day, we were representing the Navy and uh, everything we were doing was, was to represent them uh, up in New York for the army Navy game. So have you got to go to the game? Yeah. So they, they had me up to the game this past year. Which oh. was, that was that whole experience. So I mean, I'm getting goosebumps right now thinking about it because that was, uh, you know, and that, that robbery is, 
usually the point spread on that is not over three points for you know either side. And this year, <clears throat> Army was eight and three, and Navy was three and eight, and Army was favored by I think a little over a touchdown, and, and Navy took it to them. And the thing I'd learned the year before, because Army had beaten them the year before, and we'd done all that work, is that they kind of mothball <laughs> when they lose that game. They they basically get rid of everything that had to do with that uniform um, just because it represents a loss to army. And so we had really ramped up um, you know, production and effort on this uniform shoot and everything for, uh, you know, this past year. And so with them being under, you know, such a big underdog, knowing all that stuff was kind of on the line and, and have them you know, win that game, and knowing that that uniform and stuff is going to represent a, a big win over Army, uh, and it's just a cool uniform. It represents, and there was the Fly Navy represents the F-18s and uh, all of that. And you know, and then we got to work with all the guys out on the boat, and knowing that all those folks are watching that uniform, the uniform reveal, and all that. I mean, it's just it's hard to explain. You know, just how cool that is. All right. So when is when is Army and Air Force going to give you a call? <laughs> <laughs> well it was funny because after that first shoot with with navy and you know, we go back to the one out in the water uh the one of the guys that does stuff for army reached out to me on instagram and said he had you know he was like i had to find out who did the <laughs> who is this the son navy of a bitch? Stuff because it looks so much better than it has uh you know basically ever <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so I thought that was pretty funny. They they weren't gonna show up at your house, kidnap you, and take you off to Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> no, they've got a they've got a talented shooter that does the stuff for Army. So, but he he, he did. He, he sent me a note saying he had to figure out who did the stuff for Navy. That's good. That's, yeah, that, that's a so wonderful took, compliment. Yeah. No. I so I um no I, I, I mean I could, you couldn't get a better one really. So, yeah. Any- but I don't know um, Air Force. I I, th- I, I think I'm they. I think just kind of, uh, I guess, transition their whole staff out. I think um, I'm not sure what's going on with the Air Force, but we did the the uh, Navy uniform. Uh, they had a Marines uniform this past uh, past year when the, for the Air Force game, and they did not play very well. And so that was kind of another factor that added into just kind of what was on the line for that Army Navy game, knowing that um, you know it was going to be hard for them to win that game, and then. When they did, it made it all that much better. Right. <laughs> but so, too, with Under Armour, they, and this is kind of the word I got, was they um, really were excited about the um, results that, uh, you know, were pr- produced from that shoot um, the previous year. And so then they, they came up with that second Marines uniform. So then they had two uh, special uniforms for Navy the following year um, that we got to do. So that added another, you know, full shoot. That's all you can do is keep rolling over clients and making that money, making beautiful pictures. <laughs> just, uh, that was a compliment as well. Under Armour added a shoot and then, you know, hearing from, uh, from the guys doing the army stuff was, was really cool. Yeah. Now that's, that's really what you want is just one client likes it. The other client that's a part of it, sees it, they bring you in and, and then it just spreads through relationships. Yeah, exactly. Right, because you know, if you're a complete ass clown on that shoot, or things don't pan out, people don't start calling. But if you are professional, you'll deliver unbelievable imagery. It's it's in your favor that there's going to be a happy person at the end, and they're going to tell somebody. Well, exactly. And there's no better tool than uh, word of mouth. Yeah, and that's uh, you know, you can make all the pre- the prettiest pictures in the world, and if you are you know, not fun to work with or not enjoyable to, to, you know, create something with, uh, it doesn't matter, you know, what, what you produce, uh, you're just not going to get rehired by that client. So, uh, that's the best calling card that you can have is, is repeat business from, from clients. Oh yeah, absolutely. God, if your subject doesn't matter who it is, tells you that, uh, tells the next person, Oh, James was great to work with. Everything was perfect. That's great. If they don't, oh, he was a pain in the ass. That phone doesn't ring. No, and 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 that's so that's you know, and that's where you know people have to realize in this business, it's more than just taking the pictures. It's uh, you know creating an atmosphere, uh, you know, and and making everyone feel at home and comfortable and 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 really enjoy the process because uh, that's 
you know, you can be a mediocre photographer, but if you're, you have the funnest sets to be on, it's more than likely that they're going to gravitate toward that than hiring someone that might be a little more talented, but might be a total stick in the mud. Right. And I, you've mentioned this in some of your videos. It could be as simple as playing some music, yeah. even having some water on there, some snacks, just some simple stuff. You don't have to have a taco truck, but just make it fun. Yeah, well, I mean, it's and have you know even have like chairs for people to sit in stuff like that. I mean, you can, you know, I mean, it, it's part of it. You could set up two guys on on the same side of the street and you know have someone that that kind of pays that attention, you know, pays attention to those aspects, mm-hmm. and they could set up next to each other. And you have a photographer with this camera, and then you have a photographer next to him with a cooler of water and some chairs and uh, you know some music playing stuff like that. And it's uh, you know a much more pleasant experience for whoever, you know, works with that guy than, you know, just kind of going through the motions. Right. So this was something I wanted to talk about because you had a video about your pre-shoot anxiety and, and that build up and what you've gone through. And I think this is something young photographers deal with and they don't know exactly what's happening in front of them or how to resolve it or what's going on. It just becomes like a giant snowball going through hell and they don't know how to deal with it. What was your situation dealing with your, you know, your beginning? And even you talked about like, you're still doing it now, your pre-shoot anxiety about on a set and how it goes. How do you handle it? (laughs) I mean, there's, unfortunately, there's no real magic bullet to it. And some days are different than other days. And I, I just, I don't know. I guess, you know, how chemically all that works in some situations just, you know, can, at least for me, speaking for me, it can put me in more of an anxious kind of setting than, than other situations. And, uh, it's just, for me, it's, you know, and I kind of mentioned this in my video, I think, uh, some of that goes away just when I do little things like, you know, hold my camera. It's kind of like a, almost like a, you know, a warm blanket type Mm -hmm. of thing, just because I've spent so much time (laughs) using, a camera, it's kind of, I, you know, I'm, I'm confident with, with the camera. So, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, you mentioned like the Angie Harmon thing, there were so many things going on with that, that were unknowns. And, uh, you know, I'm, I had to have a uh, earpiece in, uh, to hear what the creative direction was from New York. And then they were seeing everything that came across my screen. And I had an actress in front of me that I knew had been photographed, you know, tens of thousands of times. I didn't want to be, you know, that boob who didn't came across like not knowing what I was doing and, right. you know, have lighting she didn't like or, you know, what have you. I mean, you can dream up all kinds of nightmare scenarios. And it's just a matter of kind of trying to push that out. And that's kind of where I, I just grab the camera and I'll hold it. And, you know, and that's just kind of my security, uh, you know, type of blanket. And then, you know, to just try to, I'm not good at it, but try to do, you know, positive self-talk where, you know, if hopefully you can say I've been here before, <laughs> even if you haven't, it's, it's, um, you know, where you do enough test shooting to where, you know, so you do light tests, you know, have you got an assistant or have, you know, someone, you know, around there, just get out in front of your lights if that's what's going on. Or if you got to bounce, you're outside, you know, just with the weather, uh, just kind of get some stuff in the can, just practice stuff to where, you know, you're, you're set, um, for success. Yeah, uh, it's just little things like that to where you can be mechanical when they come out and, and you're actually kind of on, you know, when the lights go on for real. Uh, but it's and we were kind of and talked about, it, I think, a little bit before we got on here. And it's kind of, uh, you know, what they call the imposter syndrome of like where you just feel like, you know, you're fooling all these people. You don't really know <laughs> what you're doing. You know, you're crazy. You know, these people are crazy to have brought you here. To, I mean, I could have been like that on an aircraft carrier it's like you know what, what am i doing here uh you know it's but you've just gotta gotta realize that most of those people are actually feeling that as well right um, even these creative directors there there's you know until they do it they really hadn't you know done it and that's like per job so uh you know it, that does kind of help me some when i when i realize that you know basically everyone is feeling that to a certain extent yeah i think there was one note you made in that video that I think can resolve a lot of, a lot of that pressure on people is your pre checklist. Yeah. Because a lot of it, you show up and you're like, Oh, I forgot the PC cord or, Oh, I didn't get enough AAA batteries. 
Never pack the day of the shoot. If you're leaving at 6 a.m., you do not pack at 4 a.m. You pack yeah. the night before. And I've even was taught as an assistant, build the set, then pack it. Don't like get everything together. So you know if you missed a pole or a C stand or the sandbags, like build the whole thing, then pack it up, make it as much as clean and compact as possible. And then you know where everything's at for the next day. Yeah, that is a that is a fantastic point. The, um, and that that did that remind me of my assisting days, and I've kind of fallen off of that, just being lazy, I guess. But yeah, building the set and then packing it, breaking it down, packing it, you know, breaking it straight into cases, basically. Yeah. So you. Don't- um, but yeah, the the checklist was. Um, I'm glad you brought that up too because I kind of skipped over that. But that was a huge part of. I guess the anxiety of like traveling and going to a shoot when I would, you know, I would get out of here, get to the airport and like, God, did I remember my charger? Did I <laughs> remember this? And and that, and it's just stupid. Cause you know, it's, you just, it's your brain playing tricks on you. And, and, and sometimes it you know was more than others, but if I had that checklist there, I could, you know, just, it would keep all that chatter out of my head. Right. Cause the, the last thing you want to be, is not confident on the set and it starts to show and you're trying to give direction or coach someone up in a photo shoot or just even be commutative to the art director or the creative director and like, no, this is what we're going to do. And you're looking at mood boards and you don't want to be weeping in the corner. (laughs) (laughs) Right. You know, like, what am I doing here? Oh my God, I should be working at Home Depot. Like, right, right, right. Well, I mean, me, myself, like for one, when I get everything set up and I get a couple of test shots and I'm, like I said, holding my camera and then, you know, and then the talent shows up or what have you. I, by that point, I'm usually, you know, ready to rock and roll. I'm, I'm kind of in the, in the zone. Right. It's just the, the build up to that point and uh, where sometimes it's just, you know, your mind playing, playing tricks on you. Right. No, I saw... There's an old documentary on the Stones, and it's like 70s, middle 70s, and they're 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 hitting it at this point, right? They're they know what they're doing, and they're sitting backstage, and you can see like Charlie's being great, and everybody. Mick was really like nervous, and he's jumping around like a beanpole. But once yeah. he got on that stage, boom, he was Mick Jagger. Like yeah. The nerves were gone. He was going to sing, you know, get all, that mic in his hand. Yeah. And- he was going to look over and see the guys and it was rolling. And a lot of times that's what it is for us. Like once it starts, Oh, okay. I know. What right, I'm, right. I know what right. I'm doing. I'm Mick Jagger. I know what I'm doing. But beforehand you're, you know, wetting yourself. Cause you don't even know if you can sing Brown Eyed Girl, which is even right. their well, song. <laughs> well, and I guess in that case too, you got, well, and some of them have teleprompters now, but just <laughs> remember the words and stuff. <laughs> that's true. That's true. And that's what, that's what would mess with me on that end. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I've done it. You had an earpiece when you said you were doing Angie Harmon. I, during COVID, Apple shut down its photo studio here at Culver City. And the company I work for, we had, we were doing their work um, for Apple. And I had that same thing like you, where I had a giant screen and I had 40 people watching me do a photo shoot on a yeah. Zoom. And it's like, you know, everybody's chiming in and I'm just like, oh my God, I wish I was just alone. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and in some instances, I mean, that's where you just got to weather it. Yeah, uh, storm there, but you know that's and you. That's when you hope the client realizes or someone that you know can can see the bigger picture that there are too many chefs in the kitchen, that type of thing. <laughs> you know, nothing gets done. Nothing. But no, I mean that's you know you go back to just different different clients and different jobs, and sometimes you have input, sometimes you don't, and it's just all part of uh, you know the grind. What we call you know being this type of uh, in this type of profession. Yeah. I love your channel for the fact that you're pushing creative envelopes and you're willing to share the information. It's one thing if you're like, I'm making these modifiers and I'm not telling anybody, <laughs> you know, they can all go to hell or, you know, the, uh, the, the cutouts you did with the Hornets with the background, the phone yeah, core cutouts. Yeah you know, um, that kind of stuff. And you make, and you're not even making those phone core products, but you're making the modifiers, but you're still showing people like, this is a creative way to do it. Right. That is the best thing that I think 
we can do as photographers as we've got some years under our belt is to give out some of that knowledge and show people like, you know, hey, it's a small community. Like, let me help you out. Let me help you make better pictures. Is that well, some, is that something it, you wanted to do in in the channel? Or well, did it I mean, it, it just it just kind of evolved, I guess, in a sense. And that, I mean, that's just kind of, I mean, I guess part of my personality. And I did like, you know, I can remember back when I was trying to figure out different things, and you know, I would work with certain photographers and or be like kind of a ghost on the set and you know, some photographers were open about what they were doing. Others were, you know, kind of, for lack of a better word, I mean, jerks about it and not, you know, they, they didn't want you to see certain things. Mm -hmm. And I just remember how I felt being around those types um, that were closed off thinking that they were doing something that, you know, I don't know, some, you know, a style of, of work that they just weren't going to share because it was what they had come up with. And I don't know, to me, that just kind of put just a really bad, taste in my mouth and you know i just kind of told myself don't ever be that type of of person but you know, not just even a photographer i mean that type of person right and so you know i've tried to carry that into you know what i'm doing on youtube and you know and you get people like you know, why are you showing people all your secrets and stuff and this that and the other and <clears throat> i mean it's really not not a secret it's yeah i hate to tell uh, you it, people it's not a secret <laughs> right i mean it's it, but it comes down to like practice and stuff like that and and long hours doing this and uh, just because and i've and i've gotten <laughs> i've gotten several you know plenty of messages where you know someone will watch my video and we kind of mentioned it earlier about uh like the the navy stuff out in the um the water mm -hmm. you know and i was getting these pictures sent to me and the photographers obviously on the bank of the river and, and it just didn't look anything so they're like why do my pictures don't they don't look anything like yours and it's <laughs> you know it's like well you got to get in the river you know type of thing and um it's but it's see i'm putting <laughs> i'm putting it out there and it just it takes a lot more i guess than just someone showing you how to do it but you have to go out and do it yourself and figure out what doesn't work and what does work you know, on your own. Um, and that's the only way you really, really learn. It's like, you know, reading something in a book and then actually doing it. It's like reading a recipe. The first time you cook it is probably not going to be as good as the 10th time you cook it. Right. So same type of, uh, concept, uh, there. And then, and that just naturally weeds out the people that aren't as passionate, um, about, you know, what we do. And, and, um, they don't, they don't need any help from me telling them or not telling them what to do. So, um, if, if people are passionate out there, I'm more than, more than, um, welcome, you know, I'm more than happy to help them. What sparked the idea with the modifiers? So that goes back to the, the, uh, foam core idea where I, I mean, we cut the, uh, pattern, the slits out of the, the, um, foam core. And I actually had seen that, um, just, you know, with the pandemic, having a lot of time on my hands, I could just sit and scroll through Instagram. And I, and I came across <laughs> some work that, that John Grass had done up in Chicago. And, uh, and we had, we had kind of recognized each other's work prior to that. And it kind of built up a friendly back and forth. Um, uh, and so, you know, I saw those come across. And I was like, John, what, you know, what is, tell me about that setup. Cause I naturally, thought that that would look good with you know athletes and stuff um doing athletic portraits he had it you know with guys that were dressed like in black tie outfits and mm -hmm. stuff you know, it looked really you know he's a perfectionist and a craftsman in his own right and uh but i was thinking at it from a different angle and so you know we went back and forth and he kind of told me what he was doing so then you know i took the idea and, and did some other things to it um and kind of did my version and uh and it just, you know, it it, <laughs> it really caused kind of a stir. It still does you know, online. And so, and then the team, the, the players, they all loved it and stuff like that. But the main problem with that is it's uh, two four by eight half inch pieces of foam core that if you don't have a truck, you know, you can't, you know, you can't go anywhere with it basically right. once you have it set up, unless you want to tear it up uh and then set it back up and then that stuff you know you you travel with foam core and oh that, no way <laughs> a couple of dings here a couple of dings there and uh you know it's it's done and so i was trying to think of 
a way to do something with a similar effect, but then where it could be portable. And in my studio here, as I'm kind of walking and talking, and it's exactly what I was doing just kind of when I was trying to think uh, of, you know, what I could do that would be something similar. I've got a picture of uh, one of the Falcon players where they actually had the Maxi Brute light banks like they have out there, you know, in California and on those fancy Hollywood sets. Right. And they had it there for their video introduction uh, video. Um, but what I did, I saw they had um, it all set up and I went and, you know, they, they let me take some kind of background plates, pictures of them. Then I could composite the players with that in the background. And long story short, I've got a picture of that on the wall here. And the same type concept with backlighting that's in the frame with the athlete. And so I was just like, wow, maybe that that would work. And so, you know, I first started with like more foam core because that's what I knew and cut holes in the piece of foam core, Velcroed it into a softbox. Uh, and it worked, you know, kind of. Sure. Um, and I knew that after setting it up, breaking it down, and that foam core was not the answer because <laughs> – um, putting it in once or twice and it was getting all torn up. And so then I had a local seamstress sew something together based on that and, uh, and started kind of modifying um, these types of things and realizing that the fabric makes it even more portable because yeah. then you can fold it up and take it with you. And then uh, or these actually roll up, which is nice. And, uh, and so it's something you can, you know, put in your kit and easily put up, uh, you know, really quickly. And, and so my last video with the, uh, the women's basketball team, uh, here at South Carolina, who just won the national championship, by the way. Um, we did, I did a second set with those lights along with my white psych wall and just to kind of demonstrate how easy it is to use those and get a completely different look. So I'm, you know, excited that uh, I hopefully have those out here pretty soon. Uh, yeah, to... it, it's going to be a great look. Every high school photographer and college guy is going to be running around with those modifiers <laughs> in their bag. Well, and the cool thing, too, is I, I, I came out with uh, five different sizes. So uh, if you and, and these will fit in relatively inexpensive um, soft boxes. So, you know, yeah. you obviously have to have a strobe. But if you've got, you know, a couple extra strobes or a couple strobes, you know, in your kit or, you know, got a little money, go get you a couple more. And you can set these up, use different size modifiers, create a unique backdrop that, you know, Joe photographer down the street who might have these mods as well uh, is doing something totally different. So uh, there's some creativity, you know, still left there for um, photographers to kind of, you know, create something unique to what they're doing. Yeah, because I saw when you first started, you were shooting Alien Bees. Now you're a pro photos. So yeah. it doesn't matter. They'll fit in any, like, strip bank, whether it's, you know, uh, what, a one by three or a three by four or a three by three. Like, you can make it work for you and look great. Yeah, and, and as long as you just – yeah, I mean, they'll go on the boxes. And I've got yeah. lists of um, boxes that they fit on that I've actually uh, brought in here and, and tested them on on the, uh, the Pro Light Mod website. So, uh, you know, the, ho the, the hope was that you might have the boxes already, but if not, it's crazy. You can get some of these boxes for like 40 bucks. What, what still gets your creative juices going? What still fires you up? Uh, I mean, it's just, the, I mean, it's just the process, I guess, in itself, I mean, and, and trying to, you know, do different things like, you know, use, using like these light modifiers and just coming up with, with new, you know, kind of looks. And then, and then at the same time, throwing it back to kind of tried and true type of stuff and just mixing it up. I mean, every, you know, every time you, you get the light case and, and, um, get your camera and, you know, depending on your setup, I mean, it's just an opportunity to create something out of nothing. Right. And I mean, that's just, you know, it's just, it's, hard to uh hard to explain but it's uh you know it's for me and that's I and mean, it goes all the way back to you know going out in the uh dark room and in the shed in my backyard and, and seeing that print you know come out in the developer it's the same type thing where where are you absorbing some of your creative 
like to gather your juices? Are you going to like bookstores or is it Instagram or where do you, <laughs> but it used to be bookstore. Well, bookstores and, and magazines and stuff like that. Uh, I miss I guess, that. I know. I know. You see when, and I still get like the, uh, archives and the CAs and stuff like that. Um, and, and I'll have, I've got stacks of those here, which I'll flip through every now and then. But I mean, like, um, Instagram is, is a good spot for that. Although it seems to be more and more riddled with ads, but if you, you know, kind of find photographers and then I mean, even going on uh, websites and stuff like that, that's another you know great tool where I've got just bookmarks of, um, photographers who I enjoy their work and every now and then I'll just kind of have uh, a Zen session where I just kind of bounce around from, you know, other, other folks work and just kind of see what, what's doing. Yeah. Uh, that type of thing. It's, it's something that I think the young photographers, creatives in general need to do. And I, I, there was a lot more, it's so stupid. We have to bookmark the pandemic as a point in time, but pre pandemic, I used to get, probably 40, 50 catalogs a month. I would, you know, either best made Fessel, Ralph Lauren, whatever. And I, yeah. and I love to see a lot of catalog catalog work. Cause then you get an idea of like posing and colors and just ideas. That was always a good cheap way of seeing stuff as well. And then since the pandemic, everybody seemed to have cut their catalogs down to basically non-existent. Oh, yeah. Well, a lot of it's moved online and stuff and they, they advertise on, you know, your Facebooks and your Instagrams and and that type of thing. And that's kind of, unfortunately, where you're going to look for maybe something else and then that finds its way (laughs) onto your stream. Right. Yeah. Uh, Todd Snyder, he still sends me something every week or every month, it seems like. So at least he still loves, loves making a catalog. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, well, I guess on the flip side, we're, they're saving trees somewhere. Yeah, that's it. Trees are being saved. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> hey, James, if you weren't a photographer, what would you be doing? Man, I have, I have, I mean, you sent me that question and, and that's, um, I, if I wasn't a photographer, I'd be trying to figure out how to be one, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I, I'm a, I'm a visual person, but I can't draw. And, uh, and that's, that kind of holds me captive, I guess, in, in a sense. And without the camera, I really can't, uh, you know, create. And I've, I've kind of, you know, and I've, I, I've, you know, I enjoy music and stuff like that, but I don't have the discipline to, you know, learn how to play music. And but I enjoy, you know, the process and and, and that type of thing. But it's just, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just glad photography's here. So I'd be you, miserable somewhere doing something else, I guess. So you're telling me stick figures and playing the spoons is not uh, the it, best. It, no, no. That, for- I mean, I could I could do that, but I I don't think I would. Uh, I don't think many people would be offering me uh, pennies for that. <laughs> if <laughs> if money was like no object, someone said, here's a blank American Express card, do whatever you want. What project would you want to go do? Oh, um, well, I, to be honest, I mean, that's, that's a complicated question, I guess. I'd, I'd have to, uh, I mean, I'll probably dream up something. I, mean, I enjoy... So I guess back in, let me, I'll go back and and I kind of did something like that in a sense. I did, uh, I guess it was around 2013, 2014. Um, I was just slammed on doing, I uh, did a bunch of uh, work for like Las Vegas and I did uh, Chelsea Handler's book cover mm-hmm. um, and just a lot of post intensive work, a lot of direction given to me where I, you know, I did not really have any input, um, and several big projects like that in a row. So then what I did is I put together a full, um, photo shoot here, the revolutionary war site. And I had wardrobe flown in and I um, hired a producer and had, uh, models, uh, come in to fit certain roles. And we, we did casting and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, put together a, um, just a full on photo shoot for like three days on location, um, yeah. which was kind of a period piece. Yeah. I, when I first saw that on your site, I thought it was for something for, you know, FX or some television show that it was going to be. It looks fantastic. Well, I appreciate that. So that's, yeah, I mean, that's one area. I mean, I've had little dips here and there, um, in the entertainment world, uh, 
but that you know that is still kind of like in the in the bucket area of, of producing like key art for um you know like a motion picture or tv series or something like that it's just right. something that um it's still floating out there that i'd love to do i'm just um kind of out of i guess the mix here in south carolina we don't have too many uh hollywood studios um making decisions in this part of the the woods and this day and age everything is kind of i think the same people are doing the same stuff kind of over and over with a lot of that yeah you could see that with movie posters and stuff like that yeah so now where did you get so damn good at post-production work because i was gonna say if you weren't a photographer you could hell you could be a production artist well and i've I've had offers back in the day too of, of being um you know doing posts for some big name photographers and i just knew that i'd wanted to be the photographer because that's where like when I was assisting on set that uh you know in the back of my head I was like I could I could be doing this you know and I'm I'm making a tenth of what the photographer's making it's just you know time out our time but the post part was kind of part of I guess finding my style too I just knew that you know back in the day that to separate myself uh you know in that era which was the you know 2000s uh, you know, I needed to kind of have a full package of capturing the image and then being able to handle it, you know, afterwards and then, you know, being able to kind of, you know, manipulate it, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, which, you know, this day and age doesn't seem like that big of a deal because <clears throat> everything's so much easier. You know, it's like everything else going from film to digital. Photoshop has gotten to where, you know, you can, everything is, is pretty easy to manipulate these days um, with the tools there, which make, makes life easy but um you know back then it was kind of part of i guess the style that i was working on to kind of separate myself from you know the other work that was out there right but it was just hours and hours you know it's kind of like the ten thousand hour thing is probably why i have to wear glasses now <laughs> <laughs> just sitting in front of that computer uh you know pixel to pixel yeah that'll get you boy that, yeah that damn computer could be evil uh, yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, it's just something I really enjoy doing. Uh, it's part of the photography process. You know, it was the digital dark room, I guess. It's a, it's a nice touch on the channel when you're showing your work and then showing your post-production work and what you can do to manipulate and change and add stuff. It's, it's a nice layer to your channel on that. Yeah. And I try to stress too, that you, 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 you have to have, uh, you know, a, a good solid foundation, uh, you know, to kind of take the images to like the next level. I mean, you can't, it's kind of like what my, my dad used to say, you just can't make chicken salad out of chicken shit. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to start with the camera and then you can't, you know, the worst thing I hear is, oh, we'll save it and, and, and post that oh, type of thing. And that's, God. That's the worst. And so, and I never, and when I, if I hear that on a job, then I know I'm not doing my job. So, uh, you know, when I hand stuff over, um, for someone else to retouch, you know, my favorite compliment there is, and you make our life so easy with the quality of these images that, you know, we really don't have to do anything. Yeah. Maybe touch a couple of levels and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's kind of too, where, you know, I build some pretty crazy light setups and it's kind of, so that when the image pops across on the screen right there for everyone on set to see, it looks, you know, 90%, if not more there, uh, you know, right out of the camera. And that's where, you know, you kind of get that on set experience where people see that and they're like, Oh wow. You know? And cause it doesn't look anything like that when you're just looking at someone in front of your camera. No. Uh, but then when the lights flash and you got them set right and it comes across in that computer screen, you know, that's where they see the craftsmanship. Um, and all the hours and uh, time that, that you've put into uh, to doing what you're doing. Tell me, where can people find the modifiers? So they're called Pro Light Mods, and the website is ProLightMods.com, uh, spelled just as it sounds. Okay. And, uh, and they should, as of like this podcast, <laughs> go ahead and, and – I'm not sure when you're publishing that, but they just arrived midway through this podcast. They did. Uh, <laughs> I could have so tested that. People. Gonna, <laughs> <laughs> so inspection's going to take place, and uh, with the weekend right here, they will. I'll probably start getting them out. Um, you know, next week. All right. Well, I'll make sure I I put a link in the podcast notes and everything, so we could sell you out, and you'll have to go get a third and fourth order, and everybody will be able to enjoy those in the 
upcoming you know calendar year for sports and everything else you could do it with yeah absolutely i mean i i, I you know my thought is that these kind of are a uh, inexpensive way to replace those light banks that you know you do see in like set designs and stuff and yeah. so um you know they can be um you know used in more things than just sports what's going to be the next thing coming up on the channel on, on youtube uh, well, there'll probably be more stuff along the lines of uh, these mods, just because I got them in. I'm, I need to get some, um, probably do do some explainer videos to make sure that everyone knows kind of uh, you know how to use them. And then, and it's it kind of goes along with what we we're talking about too, is uh, just kind of I guess uh, emphasizing the fact that um, just because you strap something on your your lights and you get the the newest gadget doesn't mean it's just gonna you know make things look automatically, you know, amazing. You still have to practice and, and learn how to work with, with things. And, and so just want to stress that type of, uh, aspect of right. <laughs> yeah. what I've got going on here. Cause I just, you know, it's like, uh, you know, filters and, and Photoshop. I mean, people, you know, what filter is that, you know, how thinking you can click a button and things just look magical. And so it's not, not just that easy. You kind of have to know what you're doing with them and, and spend some time practice with them. Just want to stress to people that you know, just because you put these on your lights and you go out without practice and um, they're just going to work on their own. Tell them it's the 25 year filter. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. um, that's kind of going to be probably next up on the channel. And I've also got the, uh, the new Canon R5C and, and been pro- playing with that some. And How you liking it? That- I, at first, I was a little, little, you know, taken, taken aback with the uh, the size of it compared to the R five. It's got a fan in it, for God's sake. Yeah, and it's yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's got a growth coming out the back. And, yeah. Uh, but, and then I also was a little bit taken back with you know how separated the video is with the uh, the still. Um, and I'm thankful that I've got a Canon C70 that I shoot uh, my YouTube stuff on now. Um, which has the same menu system that this R5C has when you click it to video. Okay. But all that being said, I'm actually loving the fact that it's like completely separated from photo and video with a flick of a switch. That, that, that's nice that there's a separation. Uh oh. The camera. Oh. And, um, and so. Um, and having those kind of set in, in their own separate worlds is, is, you know, I'm, I'm really growing to like that aspect of it. Where can people, uh, find you on Instagram, YouTube, and where else? Like in, on your website, where can they find your work? Okay. My, my work is on, uh, my website, which is quantsphoto.com and that's, uh, Q U A N T Z P H O T O.com. And then all my socials are at quants photo. So okay. if you can get the website right, you can get the Instagram they can find and the you. Twitter. <laughs> um, and then there's ProLight Mods, um, at ProLight Mods, too, on uh, Instagram. And uh, But if you can find me, I've got a it's link for me as well. So okay. um, that's kind of kind of where you can you can unearth me. Are, are you happy with the way the channel's going? Yeah. I mean, I, it, it's been a fun outlet. I'm, I'm I, you know, it's, it was no, there was no expectation there. Like I said, I, I started it as... Uh, just a creative project for me uh, to have an outlet. I mean, I think the first video I did was, you know, just going through my camera case. And what's crazy is like, that's completely flipped now. I was uh, using all Nikon stuff at the time. And now um, I'm mirrorless with uh, the Canon <laughs> and shooting video and, um, you know, and things have changed a lot, which is kind of cool. Uh, but so, it's, you know, no expectation uh, and, and, you know, there's, it's kind of neat to, you know, have a little bit of a following and be able to interact with people. And so from that too, I started a Patreon uh, where I can do uh, one-on-one Zooms with people if they're interested and we can look at their work and um, just talk about, you know, photography in general. Uh, and then, you know, on there too, I've got uh, a message board and, when I get, so people, you know, reach out to me through different avenues and it's, um, it's certain sometimes a little, a little bit hard to reply to everybody. And so, um, that's kind of where I start first with messages I get on there and, and make sure I respond to everyone there and then, um, put up, 
uh, stuff just for the patrons on there as well. So it's been neat to kind of build a little bit of a community and, and you know, see where that goes. That's a great thing. How, how is the photo community in your part of the, like the state, South Carolina? Is it a good one? I, I wouldn't say it's a bad one. It's just, it's, you know, I'm in a smaller market. And so, uh, you know, there's really not, I mean, it's kind of a good thing, I guess, but um, there's, you know, really not anyone <laughs> doing much of what I'm doing. And so, I, you know, either I'm, I'm tra- mainly traveling um, for a lot of my work. And then it's just really not that much of a community. And then plus, too, with the pandemic, it's just been hard to kind of get out and, you know, hang out with people. And so um, it's kind of that's kind of another thing with YouTube and stuff like that. I can kind of um, get out and, and circulate. And I was supposed to go to a conference back in January, but I had uh, we had that COVID spike kind of around that area, around that um, part of the year. And mm-hmm. I had some big jobs coming up right after that. So, and that conference was out in Las Vegas. And so I opted not to <laughs> make that journey just because it would, um, had, had a huge negative impact if I'd caught something I didn't need to catch. Right. So, I mean, I think some more of that is probably on the horizon. Um, just having, you know, my work has always kind of been out there, but, you know, kind of pulling myself out from behind the camera a little bit. Uh, and that's, um, been kind of fun. So I, I think, you know, more of that might be in the future of maybe talking at a conference or something like that, or, um, just doing meetups, I guess. Good, good. Cause I tell you, I I've seen growth over those two years of you being on yeah, the channel. I mean, it's not, not meteoric by any, any stretch of the word, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, people have subscribed, so <laughs> doing something. you got 7,000 people that love you. <laughs> yeah, at least. So, um, they can't all... you know, just, just basically, I mean, how, and there's really no way to kind of promote that either. So yeah, well, <clears throat> it's hopefully. kind of neat how people do find me. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's great work. You're a great person. You got a great personality. I, I, I love that. Uh, you know, I always I'm wait for that. Surprised you, you told me you watched them all. I'm just, surprised we're a here on the uh the podcast still and uh your eyes didn't start bleeding or, or something or, no because i was put, slipped you into a coma i was shocked i was like wait a minute george clooney is as a photographer oh yeah this handsome yeah. fella <laughs> i need to get those glasses that you have on now yeah yeah i, that's I feel all... better about myself every time i get up in the morning and look in the mirror uh, you're the man and then i James. need a couple to, to hand out to all the ladies around my <laughs> so, wife's not around yeah like that's that. just what you need yeah oh, more trouble. god no you you don't need the, the divorce uh channel on the podcast to say no no yeah. little drama to spice things up yeah exactly i appreciate your time thank you for what you're doing in the community and the the, the, the you know putting stuff out on youtube and and making modifiers and, and just giving back i love that you're doing that and i do really appreciate it well, thanks, Matt, and, and your audience should know that you are a um, bulldog, pit bull, what, what have you, on getting people onto your podcast. And we've we've met, connected, missed um, connections uh, here for, I guess, several months now, and um, and it's just funny that <laughs> the day we set this up that uh, you know I thought I was totally in the clear, and I have a, a huge four pallet delivery halfway through this podcast and you have the patience to put up with I, I all might, the riffraff on this end. <laughs> I might open up the, the podcast with just a, a large semi truck backing up, just, yeah. just backing right up. And beep, get get that, uh, that backup noise, that beat, beat, <laughs> That's beep. it. Right after the bell. I said, I'm, I'm like in an old uh, warehouse kind of um, somewhat building in the, uh, the ringers and an old, it looks like a firehouse bell. So when they hit the button and that's, you know, we're halfway through this podcast. I heard that and then we were in trouble. <laughs> it's all right. It gives us a, a nice flavor to this podcast, James. <laughs> so you never know you never what's going to happen. You never know that someone might be early for a delivery. Right. Or just show up out of, out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. But you know what? It's like Christmas. you got some stuff to go through and you can spend the rest of your day seeing if things are perfect. Well, and that's, that's what I'm crossing my fingers right now and, and about to crack that beer I told you about <laughs> well, before I, I dive in. I hope to hear uh, you smiling from South Carolina <laughs> instead of weeping in the corner. You and me both. All right, my friend. It was good to talk. Be uh, Thanks, Matt. Just keep producing some great stuff on YouTube, and I'll watch. 
I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best. I'm, I'll try not to let you down. I right, thanks a lot. If, man. if I have one less subscriber after this, I know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, James. I'll talk to you soon. If I go down to 6,999, <laughs> I'll know you're gone. <laughs> no way. No way. <laughs> All right, Matt. Thank you. Anytime. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you for listening to the Just a Good Conversation podcast with James Quantz. Please click the like button if you enjoyed this episode. Become a subscriber to the show. And please leave a review if you enjoyed what you heard. Remember, you can follow the podcast on Instagram and you can find all of our past shows on the website at justagoodconversation.com. Thank you for listening.